The guest speaker that we have today is Dr. William Trumbull. He's a professor of economics at the Citadel in Charleston, South Carolina. He has a BS in business administration from the University of Miami and a PhD in economics from the University of North Carolina. He's an expert on socialist and post-socialist economies with a particular emphasis on entrepreneurship in post-socialist uh, post countries. He has published a tremendous number of academic articles in prestigious journals such as the Review of Economics and Statistics, Southern Economic Journal, Defense and Peace Economics, and Public Choice. His talk today is titled Cuba Today and Prospects for the Future. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Trumbull and Ken Any of y'all have been to Cuba? Nope. One? No. No others, huh? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so as Professor Matthew said, I'm, I'm, um, my, my area of interest in research and teaching right now is uh, the socialist and post-socialist countries. Um, so I first started getting into this uh, and traveling to these places. Uh, 1990, when I um, spent a couple weeks in Hungary. And this was right after they were just, well, the, it was kind of during their, their, the first launch of their transition from socialism to capitalism. In fact, when we got there, it was still the socialist government. And while we were there, uh, one of the one one night that um, um, I was there, the newly elected parliament met for the first time, and there was the takeover of the new government from the old socialist government. So that was pretty heady times. Um, the next year, I spent a month in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union hadn't collapsed yet. Um, and each, each year after that, for several years, I would travel back to uh, Ukraine. Um, I've, I've been to Cuba, I think, something like 14 times. Um, I'm getting set to take my 12th student group to Cuba in March. Um, I've traveled to Poland, Hungary, of course. I did a Fulbright Hungary uh, a few years ago. Um, Estonia, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Georgia, country, not the state. <laughs> um, so I've got a fair amount of experience and uh, understanding of, of the social system. All right, so we're, we're here to talk about Cuba. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with some pictures. We're going to have a little picture show. And we're going to start off with the, the kinds of pictures that you see in travel brochures you know, that make Cuba look like quite the paradise and a place you want to visit. And these are all photos that I took, by the way. Um, and then I'm going to show you some other pictures. Um, that dates back to the 16th century in Havana Vieja, old, old Havana. Um, anywhere we could turn the lights down a little bit just, just while the picture show is happening. Ah. Okay, good. Uh, very, very colorful, right? Very colorful. This uh, building here with all the flags, that's a, uh, a hotel where Ernest Hemingway stayed. And today, you can go there, you can ask to see the Ernest Hemingway room. Of course, you've got to pay. Uh, they'll take you up to the room that you would stay in and, and you know, it's furnished the way it was furnished back in the day and all that kind of thing. Quite the tourist attraction. Uh, Hotel Inglaterra. Um, that's what that is. Is that the Inglaterra? Uh, no, no, it's something else. Um, but, you know, it's a beautiful, beautiful architecture in, uh, in Savannah. I mean, absolutely stunning. Oh, that's in um, Philosophy. Do you recognize that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Brill, uh, this is you know old 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 Havana. That's the cathedral. Um, uh, like one end of Cathedral Square. 
uh, really pretty. I went, I once went there, I, I, I met a, a seminarian who um, said, oh, why don't you, why don't you come on Sunday to the cathedral, the cardinal will give you homage, and I'll introduce you. Ooh, oh, I'll give you homage, introduced to the cardinal. And this guy was pretty, he was actually, there were, there was talk about him becoming pope. He was pretty influential. And so, yeah, he gives his homily, and it's over. The seminary and I go looking for him, and, and the, the, the cardinal is, is facing away from us. So we're approaching him from behind. He's talking to somebody. The seminary walks up to him, puts his hands on the, on the cardinal's shoulders, and spins them around and introduces us. <laughs> I, I, a measure of equality in Cuba, I suppose. I don't know. This is the uh, entrance to Havana Harbor. Uh, again, very picturesque. This is the real thing. I took that picture from my hotel balcony. You'll notice that uh, there's ocean water here. Uh, that building is right off of the Malacol, a famous, what's 12 kilometer long Malacol seawall that spans the north of our coast of uh, Havana, all right? And that building obviously has collapsed. Um, I read somewhere that Vanna is experiencing something of the order of three building collapses a day. I actually witnessed one. I'm driving by in a bus and whoop, building collapse as we're driving by. Uh, again, pictures from my uh, hotel balcony. Those pretty pictures I showed you were six, seven square blocks of Vanna Vieja. This is the rest of Havana. Now, Havana, prior to the revolution, was pretty wealthy by Latin American standards. Which is not to say that this was an idyllic place by any means. Um, there was tremendous poverty particularly in the countryside. The ruler, Lucencia Batista, was uh, he was a dictator. He was phenomenally corrupt. That was a man needed to go, no question about it. But by Latin American standards, Cuba was a fairly well-off country, and Havana was the wealthiest city. There was tremendous wealth, and the architecture reflects that. Look at that. This is beautiful 19th century architecture. It's crumbling. You, you know, to see the beauty, you've got to look past the, the, the peeled paint and crumbling facade. But it's really absolutely incredible. Uh, <laughs> ran across this guy in Havana Vieja. He was, uh, this is the part of the informal sector. <laughs> you know, there's this private, there's the state sector which dominates the economy. Then there's a small, highly constrained private sector, private but licensed, legal. This guy wasn't either one of them. He was uh, an informal economy. He was making his living with his pet chihuahua, I guess that's what that is, and his pet rat. And the rat would lie on the chihuahua's back. And of course, if you're a tourist, you're going to see that, and you're going to raise your camera, and he's going to put his hand down. How he made his living. I think he was making a really, really good living. Um, this is the electrical configuration here is everywhere. Somehow I don't think that would pass Atlanta building codes. Okay, so that's the picture show. Let's talk about what kind of economy Cuba has. It is a planned socialist system. Right? The economic system is called planned socialism. Right? There's actually a different kind of socialism called market socialism, which has existed only once, and that was in socialist Yugoslavia. No other country has ever um, implemented a market socialism. So the Soviet Union, Maoist China, um, East Germany, 
They're Soviet bloc countries back in the day, like Czechoslovakia and Poland, and Hungary, and Bulgaria, and Romania were planned socialist countries. Back in the say the mid seventies, something like a third of the world's population lived in planned socialist countries like that. Today, the only real fully implemented planned socialist economies are Cuba and North Korea. I don't know what the heck that is. <laughs> it's chaos. It's chaos. Um, but but that, so that's, you know, these are the countries that were being planned social economy. What are the characteristics of planned social economy? Well, first of all, um, the factors of production other than labor. What's a factor of production? What's a factor of production? Any, any econ majors here? What's a factor of production? What? Capital. capital. Okay, what's capital? Buildings, yeah. machines, robots, assembly lines, forklifts, trucks, right? The stuff we make that is then used to make the stuff that we consume or to make other capital, right? Buildings, factories, that's capital. Um, another factor of production is land, the land that those buildings sit on or the land that farmers till is a factor of production. Land is used as a resource to make the stuff, to produce the stuff that we consume. Na other natural resources besides land, or oil, and coal, the stuff that's under the, under the land. Okay? Um, labor is a factor of production. All right? So when you graduate from Tennessee State, you'll go into the labor market, and you will offer your labor services on the labor market. In a planned social economy, the state owns the capital. The state owns the land. The state owns the natural resources. They don't own labor. These aren't slave economies. So nevertheless, the, your ability as a worker to offer your labor services is highly constrained, highly dictated by the state. And yes, you will get paid. Slaves don't get paid. But the average monthly salary of a state worker in Cuba is $30 a month. You don't get paid much. There's been a recent wage reform. Do you know anything about what? what I think that $30 is out of date. It's probably higher than that now, right? Uh, it depends on how, uh, how supportive you are of the government. Oh, well, that's true. That's all. But that was always true. <laughs> uh, yeah, doctor, a doctor, a high-paid doctor might get paid the equivalent of eighty dollars a month. Uh, retail clerk, maybe twelve dollars a month. Yeah. So yeah, they're not slave economies, but <laughs> the, your, your labor services are not owned by the state. But um, no. certainly, capital, land natural resources owned by the state. Uh, centralized decision making, centralized information structure. Right? The decision making and the flow of the information is highly centralized. So what does this mean? This means that every factory, every farm, every retail outlet, every school, every hospital is an agency of the government. You go to the government to get your driver's license, right? It's called DMV here, I guess. Well, in Cuba, you go to the government to do anything, to buy anything. All the stores are the DMV. And all of the activity of these entities, these productive entities, factories, bars, hospitals, schools, that produce goods and services, their production is controlled by the state. The state plans what they will do. Economic activity is coordinated by 
a plan. Thus the name, Planned Socialist Economy. Um, Pre-revolutionary Cuba, 1950s, Cuba was fairly well off by a lot of American Caribbean standards. High literacy, um, much, much higher, for instance, in Cuba in 1950 than, say, right next door to the Dominican Republic, and certainly in Haiti, uh, where literacy was <laughs> zero. Um, incredibly high ratio of doctors and other healthcare professionals. Cuba today, and Cuba back before the revolution, has the most doctors per capita of any country in the world. A lot of money poured into Havana during this time. Uh, hotels, casinos, the tourist infrastructure, almost all of which was owned by the mafia. A lot of corruption. Dictator Batista was highly corrupt, was selling out to the U.S. Um, mafia. Um, but despite this wealth, the Cuban economy was a one crop economy. But what Cuba produced was sugar. Sugar was a major producer, Cuba was a major producer of sugar, from sugar cane. Cane sugar. Um, its economy was dominated by the U.S. with a lot of corruption, mafia influence. Meyer Lansky was a, mayor, main, uh, a major player in Havana. A very unequal distribution of wealth, uh, of welfare, income, of wealth, um, particularly the urban versus rural divide, black versus white divide. The, the, the White, people like Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, who are 100% Spanish stock, dominated the economy and still dominate the political system today. Um, blacks tend to be more poorly educated and with a much, much lower income. Very high rate of unemployment. So the triumph of the revolution, as they call it. January 1st, 1959, Fidel's forces uh, rolled into Havana. The night before, Batista has fled to the Dominican Republic with a lot of money. Uh, so what are the goals of the revolution? These are the goals stated by Fidel over and over and over again. We don't have to you know, wonder what they were. We don't have to um, figure it out. Fidel tells us. Um, reduce dependency on the U.S. Fidel wanted to reduce dependency on the U.S. So this is a huge success. That they certainly did, um, except what they got instead was an almost total dependency on the Soviet Union. Just traded the U.S. for the Soviet Union. Um, reduce dependency on sugar. That was a goal. That was a goal that was an absolute failure until recently. <clears throat> it's Cuba no longer produces much sugar. Um, the, the Soviet operated trade relationship among the other plant, among all the planned socialist economies, or at least the, the Soviet dominated socialist economies, including Cuba, locks Cuba into sugar. They are a supplier of sugar the rest of Comic Con, this trade relationship run in Moscow. In exchange for Cuban sugar, what Cuba got was Soviet oil. Because Cuba has no oil, which is something that has befuddled them. <laughs> because look where Cuba is. It's in the Gulf of Mexico. There's oil all around them. And just to the south is Venezuela, which has got the world's largest reserves of oil. <laughs> and Cuba's got nothing. How could they be that unlikely? So, the Soviet Union takes sugar from Cuba and supplies Cuba with oil. And they do so 
on terms of trade that are phenomenally in favor of Cuba. In other words, for the sugar that the Soviet Union got in exchange for their oil, they were getting a bad deal. Now, was this ignorance on the Soviet Union's part? Was this stupidity? No. The Soviet Union was highly motivated to support, to subsidize, the tune of about $4 billion a year, which is a lot of money back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, for a population of one million people. Um, it subsidized that economy to crop it up because there's no way certainly not fly without the Soviet Union just thought it was worth the price to have this socialist country off the shores of the United States. Um, what else? Let's see. Uh, achieve rapid, rapid economic growth through industrialization. This is common to all planned social economies. Most of these planned social economies, certainly the ones where the uh, the the, where there was a revolution that took place that launched uh, the social system. Um, where, where, where was the first one? Where was the first rev uh, revolution? Where was this planned socialist economic system invented? And what kind of a country was Russia in 1917? Very poor. <laughs> Very poor. Okay. Most people um, were basically subsistence farmers uh, in a, a economic political system that could be best described as something in between feudalism and capitalism. They really did not have a capitalist system at the time of the revolution. Right? They had pretty much a feudal system. The czar owned everything. And he let his aristocrats, his nobles, um, have big tracts of land that the czar said, well, oh. and the nobles would have their serfs work their land. And that was the kind of economy that Russia had at the time. It was a backward backward country with very small industrial base for a country that size, and for a country that is arguably the resource richest country in the world. I mean, name a resource, oil, coal, diamonds, timber, farmable land, arable land, I mean, name it, Russia has it, and yet it was a backward, backward country. Um, China, so the revolution that launched socialism in China, per capita income, maybe $700, $400, something close to zero. There is uh, an intense desire by these countries to do two things, to catch up with the capitalist world, why? Because the capitalist world are enemies. They feel threatened by the capitalist world, and they feel way behind. So they want to catch up. And also, achieving, achieving rapid economic growth is one of the ways by which they prove the superiority of the social system, as Marx predicted. Right? If this really is a superior economic system, as Marx predicted, then they ought to be able to outgrow the capitalist world. Reason, right? So this is a goal of all the planets, not just Cuba. Well, did they achieve that? Uh, here's an index of per capita GDP going back to 1959 uh, up to 1989. I ended 1989 for a reason. Well, I'll pick up that story a little bit later. Um, and it, by index, you know, what, what I've done is construct an index that simply relates the economy that year to that economy in the base year, which in this case is 1959. So obviously, the index has a value of 100 for every country because it had the economy 
that it had in 1959. In 1960, presumably, it grew a little bit, right? So the index would be 100 and something if it grew. You know, if it grew 3%, it would be 120. It's about 3% higher. Okay, you get, you get the idea of how this index works? Uh, so they all started with 100. Now, if, if I were to just show absolute per capita income, Cuba would be relative, would be high relative to these countries. Pretty high. Okay? But relative to its own base in 1959, uh, this is the Cuban economy and where it ends up, at least according to official statistics in 1989, well below, for instance, the Dominican Republic, which was a much poorer country than Cuba was in 1959. In other words, the Dominican Republic has been, has, has succeeded by 1989 to grow its economy over 200%. Uh, Cuba has achieved much less than that. And here's, here's Puerto Rico, which has grown its economy 300 plus percent by 1989. So, has, has Cuba, at least up to 1989, achieved this goal of rapid economic growth, outgrowing the capitalist world? Clearly, uh, that's not the case. Okay, uh, to continue uh, with these goals, they want to reduce inequality. They succeeded, all the rich people left. Uh, there was a huge brain drain. The doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, the professionals, for the most part, left Cuba and went to places like Miami, and by far and away, especially in the early years, they were almost all white. So the white population is drained. That's the professional class. That's always been the favorite class in Cuba. Um, and so you'll, if you go to Miami, you will see a very different population of Cuban Americans than if you were to go to Havana, where the population now is primarily black. So there was a huge drain, mostly of the white professional class. Um, so there is a more equal distribution in there. Everybody is equally poor. Um, another goal is to, re to eliminate unemployment. Success! The, the socialist economy provides guaranteed employment. If you are 18 years old and not going on to college, um, well, you'll we'll be able to stick in the military. <laughs> uh, but after that, uh, a couple of years in the military, uh, you'll get a job. Work in the factory or work in the hospital, maybe, or working somewhere or going to college. This is one of the main promises of socialism, guaranteed employment, economic security, the state provides, including providing a job, as long as the state doesn't decide to do our enemy of the state. Okay, so let's um, was a period of turmoil. First of all, the U.S. establishes, establishes this embargo on Cuba, this trade embargo. So the U.S. will no longer buy anything from Cuba. And with the exception of agricultural products and medical products, Cuba cannot buy anything from the U.S. Uh, during this is a period of this considerable brain drain, and there was an attempt, that I'll show you in a second, of, of a great leap forward. What, have you heard of this term, great leap forward? What is that normally applied to? What country is that applied to? China. China had experienced this great leap forward, which was an attempt to bypass socialism. What Marx said is the countries develop they, as they develop, as they evolve, they go through these stages. Feudalism, 
is replaced by capitalism. Capitalism is a much more efficient, much more productive economic system than is humans, according to Marx. But then eventually, capitalism sows the seeds of its own destruction, and through revolution, it's replaced by socialism. And according to Marx, socialism is a far more productive, far superior economic system than capitalism. And then eventually, socialism is replaced by communism, something we have never seen anywhere in the existence of the world, uh, at least not yet. Um, China attempted this greatly before, which is to say, to leap over socialism directly into communism. Tens of millions of people started that. Tens of millions of people started very quickly. Uh, something like that was attempted in Cuba, motivated by Jacob Bob. Okay, uh, during this period, although we call this, uh, we call Cuba planned socialist economy, it in fact failed to set up the basic apparatus of a planned economy. Fidel didn't like experts. He didn't, he didn't trust experts. Sound familiar, by the way? He didn't like experts. Right? He was going to make all the decisions. He didn't need these expert planners to tell him what to do. He decided. So he never really set up you know we put in charge of industry, the, the, the minister of industry, and then the head of the central bank? Who was that person in the beginning? Anybody know? It's first pleasure for those positions. There was one person who was both minister of industry and the head of the central bank. Che Guevara. Who was Che Guevara? He was an Argentinian doctor. Actually, he wasn't. I don't know if he was a doctor. Did he get an MD? I don't know. I'm not sure he did. I don't think he ever did a president. He never got his medicine. But he sure as heck wasn't an economist. And he didn't know anything about central banking. And he didn't even know anything about how to plan an economy. And he, too, tried to engineer a great thing for him. Numerous policy reversals for a while. They would let farmers sell product and they would prohibit farmers from selling product, except to the state. And they, you know, they would have these limited private markets and they eliminate them. They would try this and try that. Total uh, reversals of policy, shooting from the hip. And by hip, I'm talking about fidelity. All right, so, so here is an index of per capita GDP uh, from 1959 to 1989. Um, the, the scale here is a little more constricted, so it looks more vertical than the last picture I've shown. But this, these are the same numbers. Okay? And I've divided it up. Here is um, this period I was just telling you about, like, uh, January 1st, 1959, to like, around 1970. Okay. Um, the base is 100, of course. And what is the value of that index in 1970? Less than 100. Over that 12 years, the Cuban economy shrank. Uh, by the way, and here's the here's the source: um, the Madison Project. Um, the Madison Project is kind of interesting. This was a baby of uh, an economist named Angus Madison uh, who developed this thing. And then after he died, which is some years ago, um, his work was continued by the Madison Project, the organization that continues the work that he started. And at least for some countries, you can get stats on per capita GDP and population going back to what? The year one. Now, how accurate that is, I don't know, but at least it's an attempt to figure out, well, what was the standard of living in year one? In year 1,000, I'd say. Um, so that's, that's where these numbers come from. 
Uh, and, and according to the Manhattan Project, uh, Cuba's per capita GDP in 1970 was lower than, what does it look like, say 92% of uh, what it was. That's a long period of time to experience no growth. In fact, zero. I mean, uh, negative. Um, so that's what we've been looking, talking about, a period of turmoil, reversals, and a great leap back. That's what this is. Okay? Things would look pretty good. This is mostly, not so much because of the superiority of the social system, because uh, world prices for sugar skyrocketed. So they're getting just more income for sugar. That's the only thing they do. Um, and as a result of the great leap backward, an attempt to demonetize Right, the, the director of the central bank tried to eliminate money. That was his task as a central bank uh, manager. Um, it was a disaster. It was a disaster. So Cuba lost a lot of ground here. And not only that, but the Cuban authorities, like Fidel, like Jay, um, were, were saying things like, oh, we're superior to those Soviets. They're dabbling around with socialism. We're leaping right into communism. Well, that's kind of irritating, Soviet Union. <laughs> and you know, they, they, they weren't real cooperative. They weren't real supportive of Cuba during the period uh, because they were really irritated. By the way, uh, anybody know when Che Guevara died? He died in Bolivia, attempting to foment revolution in 1965. So this great leap backward, it was a Guevara movement. It was a movement by the followers of Che Guevara. Um, so at that time, uh, Guevara was already, already dead. Um, let's see. Uh, so what happens here? Um, oh, wait a minute. Let, let me do this first. So this, this, is, this is all pretty much what I've uh, been telling you about um, uh, prior to, to this, this early period here. Um, in, in 1971, Cuba admits their error, that they were wrong, right? that the Soviet Union really does have it better. They really do know what they're doing. And they ask the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union was only so happy to do that. So they send in uh, advisors, experts, to set up the planning apparatus. Cuba was incorporated into Comic Con, the trading relationship of the planned social economies in 1972. This is a period of st relative stability and decent, though not great, economic growth. It was generated in part by in terms of trade and sugar for uh, oil that was highly favorable, this $4 billion uh, subsidy, uh, highly favorable to Cuba, and a massive infusion of labor and capital. Okay. You're an adult in Cuba, you have to work. If you're not in school or in the military or in, a, in prison or in an insane asylum, you work. And you have no choice. No such thing as staying home mom. All right? You work. All right? Most women, part of the revolution, were staying home moms. Right? They were required to work. That's a massive infusion of labor resources. That allowed Cuba to produce more stuff. Right? There was huge investment of capital. The problem is, is that they didn't know where the capital was needed, so much of this capital arrived was of no use, but there was a lot more capital uh, investment. Uh, so that, that's the second period here, implementation of planning and incorporation to the Comic Con. Uh, and so what you see is decent enough great economic growth that was pretty much uninterrupted from 1970 to 1985. Uh, it is a little um, and then we hit 1985. Look what happens. 
its growth is leveling off and it becomes zero. In fact, it's like negative. And now we enter into a new period. This is a period that is known as a rectification of errors and negative tendencies. The rectification period. Right? Where Fidel says, ah, I was right all along. I was right before. I find that. Okay. Um, so, um, and so another reversal, of course, uh, a lot of you know, policy reversals, and uh, they're unable to get it together. They're, they outlaw farmers markets, for instance, once they you know, for the time, the time but by that time. Emphasis on volunteer work, other than the, otherwise known as social mobilization. When I first went to Cuba in 1998, the person that I went to work with, a University of Havana professor, had been mobilized to dig tunnels under Havana for the new subway. He didn't have a choice. <laughs> All right? It was a very unproductive use of this person's labor services. He would become highly dependent on this mobilization. Um, so we enter this period uh, that is known as the rectification period. And as you can see, uh, it, 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 it Growth is pretty much flat. Uh, 1989 to 1993 is the period of crisis. Right? The, so the socialist world is collapsing. In 1991, the Soviet Union ceases to exist. Cuba loses all that support. Not only do they lose that support, that, 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 that subsidy, but 85% of their trade was with other planned socialist economies, primarily the Soviet Union, that now no longer exists. So now 85% of the trade has evaporated. Um, this is a period of extreme hardship. I mean, you, won't, you won't call it starvation because we're talking about a tropical paradise. You know, you starve, you're hungry, throw a fishing line in the water and get you dinner. You know, I mean, it's, it's hard to starve, but uh, there was a significant loss of weight in the human population, and children's growth was stunted. And there just seemed to be no end to this uh, collapse. And so Fidel makes a pact with the devil, uh, and here we see it here. So this takes the, the numbers all the way up to 2017. I've explained here in a somewhat different way. These are just annual rates of growth. But it's the same kinds of numbers that I'm showing you in our line graph. Here's that crisis period, that collapse. Uh, in 1989, the Cuban economy basically doesn't do anything. It's flat. 1990, it loses about uh, 3%. 91, it loses about 12%. 92, 12% uh, again, more or less. Uh, 1993, uh, over 15%. That's year after year after year, right? That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they've lost, by, that, by the time this is ended, they've lost over a third of their economy. All right? Fidel signs a pact with the devil, and he does things like dollarize the economy. The US dollar becomes legal tender in Cuba. <laughs> Boy, is that ironic. Opens up private, uh, uh, the small private sector. Brings back tourism in Cuba. Um, um, Foreign investment, permits foreign investment. I mean, straight foreign investment. But that stuff stops the decline, stops the free fall. And 1994, you know, that, that free fall stopped. They don't really achieve much in the way of growth. But by 95, it's picked up a little bit. But 96, it's over 7%. Pretty decent growth. That's, that's, that's rapid growth, right? I mean, the US, what's, what's the US growth now? like under 3%, okay? which is typical of a mature capital economy. Right? At this point, Fidel says, enough. We're reversing course again. He pulls private sector licenses. He increases taxes a lot on the private sector. Um, and there's the result. Okay? A bit of an uptick here because um, there's been a lot of investment in, the, in sugar, and, and that was coming up, and today this is more sugar. sugar. Um, but then 2001 happened, and they report 3% growth. 
everybody, anybody who knows anything about Cuba knows that that didn't happen. Cuba is now starting to cook. Cuba was hit by the biggest hurricane since 1950 um, that destroyed much of the sugar crop. The Russians pulled their last military base out of Cuba, for which they've been paying rent $200 million a year, plus all that employment. Uh, uh, the, and, and in 2001, what was happening in the US economy and economies around the world? The dot-com recession, the tourism was way down. There's no way Cuba achieved that kind of growth. And then by 2006, they're reporting a rate of growth of, well, of almost 13%, which would have made Cuba the fastest growing country in the world. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. But you know, so they're using a new methodology to calculate GDP, and it is not the standard methodology the rest of the world uses, and so you really can't trust it. Um, and so even using that methodology, look, they're still not able to report decent economic growth. Essentially, Cuba now is in recession, and it doesn't seem to be in recession. So overall themes, uh, a dual economy model, part of the economy operates or under central control. There is an emerging sector, um, joint ventures, Cuban trade organizations, et cetera, dual currency, uh, an attempt to preserve socialism or trying to integrate into the capitalist world, causing all sorts of economic and social problems, reintroducing economic classes, those who have access to dollars and those who don't, an attempt to insulate Cubans from evil capitalism, limits the impact of foreign investment, and forms are too shallow to have much effect, and they were subject to. Um, um, I'll skip over some of this here. Um, that's pretty much in more detail what I'm talking about, and I'm a little out of time. Um, there have been more reforms under, under uh, Raul, but they're not taking it. They're not working. And one of the things that's happening is they have to reduce their government spending and, because nobody will lend them any money, because nobody trusts them. And so um, the things they're doing is they're closing schools and they're closing hospitals. And this is, this is, this, and, and they're eliminating employment in the state, in the state sector. It was announced years ago that um, there were one million redundant workers. In other words, a million workers in the state sector that weren't needed. Well, there are only five million workers. That's 20% <laughs> of the work, that's a fifth of the workforce, right? Um, so there are a lot of things that have happened that have caused a great deal of ideological confusion and, um, and uh, distress in the Cuban population. And Cuba has now hit a brick wall. And I'll just skip over all this. Um, but you can get it from my slides. Uh, so this is where Cuba is now relative to a lot of other countries. As you can see, uh, the Cuban economy is way behind uh, what are uh, basically neighboring capitalist economies. So questions to ponder, is there still socialism? Employment is no longer guaranteed. Social services are attractive. The private sector is expanded. Uh, will reforms or will reform save or destroy the Cuban economy? 